I think the easiest thing in life is to give up on whatever, you know, whatever you're focused on or whatever you're hopeful for. The hardest thing is to keep going, but we have to. Like, we have to continue to hold on. And I would imagine for so many people out there, that is probably the most difficult thing. The best-selling author and host. The number one health and wellness podcast. On Purpose with Jay Shetty. Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every one of you that come back every week to listen, learn, and grow. Now I know that our community is dedicated to living happier, healthier, and more healed lives. And I love sitting down with people who are dedicated to their own happiness, their own health, their own healing, and doing that for the world through their work. And I have to be honest, it's not every day that you get to sit down with someone you admire, you're inspired by, you look up to, and someone who is truly the definition of the word goat. Uh, I'm talking about the one and only Sir Lewis Hamilton, seven-time Formula One world champion, someone with over 100 race wins, considered the most successful F1 driver of all time. And Lewis's willingness to embrace what makes him different has defined his values and outlook on life. And in 2014, those values saw him win BBC's Sports Personality of the Year, followed two years later by a position in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People list. Lewis received both accolades for a second time in 2020, in a year that saw him become a leading voice in the global fight for racial equality. In doing so, he was recognized as British GQ's Game Changer of the Year and Powerlist's most influential black person in the UK. And further to this, Lewis won the 2020 Laureus Sportsman of the Year Award and most notably was formally recognized with a knighthood in 2020 New Year's Honours for his outstanding achievements and contribution to motorsports on the track and off the track. Lewis is also a passionate activist for so many underrepresented groups and communities. His Mission 44 is doing incredible work. Please welcome to On Purpose, Lewis Hamilton. Lewis, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. No, this honestly is a, is a special one for me. It's been one of those ones that, you know, when I first launched the podcast, there were a few names that I wanted to sit down with and, and you were one of those names. So for me, it's a very special moment. And for this to be your first ever podcast, which you just told me, <laughs> I didn't even know. And you, you literally told me this like 10 minutes ago. And in my head, I'm thinking, wow, thank, I, I'm so grateful to have that honor, honestly. No, I'm not, no, that's it's, the, the honor's mine. I'm really so grateful for everything you do. And so I've been following and listening to you and you sent me the book a long time ago already. So I really appreciate everything you're doing today. Oh, well, thank you, man. Thank you. And, and I'm excited to unpack your journey because as we said, because it's your first podcast, People have heard parts of you, but but we don't really understand the depth and the texture of of Lewis Hamilton. And so, I guess I want to start in a in a different place, and we'll we'll kind of go through on this journey. I wanted to ask you, what do you feel is the hardest thing you've had to do in order to be who you are today? I think continuing to have the belief in myself and not letting that veer off since I was young, since I've been told from my teachers that I would never amount to nothing. The bullying or the things that you face, the adversity you face, the discrimination, and just continuing to keep your head up, continuing to to march on ahead uh, towards your dream and never losing sight in that. I think that's definitely for sure the most difficult thing is keeping, keeping your goal and your eyes set on that and not being distracted, um, not giving up. I think the easiest thing in life is to give up on whatever, you know, whatever you're focused on or whatever you're hopeful for. The hardest thing is to continue to keep going, but we have to, like we have to continue to hold on. And I would imagine for so many people out there, that is, that is, that is probably the most difficult thing. Yeah. I, I think that's a great answer because I think people look at you and they assume that you never have to make that choice, right? They see someone in your position, someone who's achieved what you've achieved and the assumption can be, oh yeah, but he's the greatest. He was, he was just always that way and he doesn't have to make that choice every day. But as you said, since the beginning of your life, whether it's childhood, whether it's breaking into a sport that wasn't set up for you, there've been so many moments. Let's, let's go back to school. Let's talk about some of that more in depth because I feel like a lot of people struggle at school, but you kind of went through a lot of altercations and adversities at that time. What were some of the things you were hearing some of the bullying, some of the racism, the experiences that you had that felt limiting or made it feel like it was easier to give up? 
I think for me, I mean, school was the most, probably the most traumatizing and diff, most difficult part of my life. Wow. Um, I already was being bullied at the age of six. Um, I think at the time, that particular school, I was probably one of three kids of color and just bigger, stronger, bullying kids were throwing me around a lot of the time. I was always the last picked in the, you know, when you're standing in the playground and you're uh, in the line of when they're picking teams for football, I was always the last one chosen or not even chosen, even if I was better than somebody else. Um, and then the the constant jabs, the things that are either thrown at you like bananas or people that would use the M word just so relaxed. Um, people calling you half cast and, you know, just really not knowing where you fit in. That for me was difficult. When you then go into like history class and everything you learn in history, there are no pitch people of color in the history that they were teaching us. So I was thinking, oh, well, where are the people that look like me? And I mean, for me, in my school, there was only around, I think there was around seven, maybe six, seven black kids out of 1,200 kids. And three of us were out, put outside the headmaster's office all the time. The, the headmaster just had it out for for us and particularly for me, I would say. So like just juggling all these different emotions that you're feeling. Plus I struggled at school. I didn't find out till I was 16 that I was dyslexic. Fortunately, I had a, came across a teacher that was actually caring and, and um, took me down that road and helped me discover a little bit more about myself and how I can better myself through education. But um, I think that for me was, that was tough. Also, because I was racing every weekend, I would leave on the Thursday night, we would travel, you know, pack up the motorhome, we would travel around the country to race on the weekends. And no one else knew when I'd get back to school, every, all the kids have done normal things on the weekend. And I'll come back and say, I'm, I was racing and people would be like, oh, I've done that before, <laughs> you know, like at the, at, the, at the theme park or something. <laughs> but no one really knew what my goal was and could really, they thought we would, maybe it was a joke. You miss that a lot of that social interaction also. I was put in all the lowest sets at school and told that if you do well, you can progress and they never ever let me progress no matter how hard I tried. Um, so I really felt that the system was really up against me and I was kind of swimming against the tide, but I'm so grateful for that that journey because that's what built me to the person that I am today. But there were a lot of things that I suppressed because I I couldn't go home and say, hey, to my I didn't feel I could go home and tell my parents that, you know, these kids, kept calling me the N-word today. I got bullied, I got beaten up at school today, or I you know, wasn't able to defend myself. I didn't want my dad to think I was not strong. And so I would, you know, if I had tears, I would hold them back. If I had emotions, it would be in a quiet place. And um, it wasn't really till I started racing that I was able to channel this emotion that I had into my driving. And it's like when I put this helmet on, Superman was my favorite. I loved how he fought for the people and I loved how he did the right things. And he was a really inspiring character for me. But again, no superhero was of color. So, you know, but you can still aspire to be someone that's, if they don't look like you, you know. Um, and so I remember going to karate. I remember putting this helmet on in racing and it felt like it was my cloak, you know, that my superpowers could come out when I was driving. And I was battling with these kids and I was doing, able to do things that they, seemed to not be able to do as well. And that was my love. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's my, mine was opposite. I was bullied a lot at school as well. I was one of five people of color in my primary school and I was also overweight. And so I was bullied for that. And obviously, you know, my parents are from Indian backgrounds. And so they'd gone through it much worse than I did when, when they'd moved to England. But the difference was that I would go cry to my mum and then my mum would come try and save the day in school and that was the worst. <laughs> that was so embarrassing. Like your mum's like telling the teacher what happened and then I'm like, oh no, mum, don't do this. <laughs> and then it's even more embarrassing because the kids pick on you going, oh, mum came to save oh, you. Oh yeah, yeah, mum is uh, boy. Yeah, yeah. mum is boy. So that, that, that was my version of it. Uh, I wasn't scared of crying to my mum, but then it, it, had, it had different things. But yeah, that, that's so hard as a kid when you're going through that and you're trying to find yourself, you're trying to figure out what confidence is, you don't even know what that means, you, 
feel like not going to school. But then even though you're saying you found it in racing, I mean, racing was similar because you were working class. You're still to this day the only working class black driver to do as successfully as you have. So not only do you have it at school, you also have it in your passion, like in the thing that is your cloak, is your Superman. So how does it feel when you're also dealing with it in that area where you've discovered what your passion or your interest is at that age? What does it feel like when you're getting it in that space? It's inescapable. Uh, you know, you use that as an escape, but then you're confronted with it also. And so I was just grateful that I had this amazing figure in my dad. You know, I got a, a, you know, my best, one of my best friends, like his dad was never there. I know there's not many people that have separated parents and, and being shared between parents is not an easy thing. Um, you know, some days with your mom and some days with your dad. My, my mom was the soft, loving parent. Uh, so that's where I really, I feel like I learned a lot of compassion and empathy. That's where I feel like I get it from her. And my dad was that that strong, like kind of stronger rock. And also just someone that looked like me on the, and just, he would say, do your talking on the track. Don't be distracted by it. Don't listen to what they're saying. Do your driving on the track and show, let's just be, be quiet <laughs> and walk away as winners, you know? Um, so, but you know, again, like your parents, he, my parents went through, or particularly my dad was someone that also face adversity through his life. And he's like, I want to do everything in my power to create a better life for my kid so that they don't feel or experience the things that I have encountered and through my, through my journey. And so, but I think for me, it was also difficult having biracial, you know, I'm biracial. So having a white mother, mother, for example, and a black dad, I knew my dad would understand the racial slurs that are thrown at me. My mom couldn't understand it. Mm. So I couldn't really speak to my mom about it. She was loving, but she had never been educated within it. She didn't know anything about black history and slavery. And so it was a very difficult, but, but I had love there, which was the most important thing. Yeah. Um, but in the racing, it was like, you know, like kids, you just want to enjoy yourself. You want to be included. And, you know, when you're kind of outcast a little bit, it's, um, it's difficult for kids, you know? And so that's why today, like, I'm like, if I'm posting something, I hope that when I do click that button, I hope that it is a positive wave for some of the kids out there that are being distracted by all the stuff that's going on around the world. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was telling you earlier, I was so grateful, came out to watch you in Austin a couple of weeks ago and got to meet your dad. And I'd heard you talk about your dad in that way before. And so when I met him, I was, it was, I was just, you know, it was nice to share that with him. And I was just saying how beautiful it is to see your relationship and, and how it's evolved. It's but, not always been that way. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. How, yeah, to, to walk us through whatever you feel. My dad has been like the leader in getting me, you know, he, he had four jobs at one stage just to keep us go-karting because when we all started go-karting, most of the people were, majority of the people were from working class families. Um, so, but then there are, of course, a few wealthier kids that have slightly better access to equipment and um, mechanics and all those sorts of things. And my dad was my mechanic. So it was just me and him on the road and, and my stepmom, Linda, um, she would be there supporting, um, making sure that we're fully clothed, making sure that we, we've eaten and we're hydrated, all those sorts of things for the weekend, preparing my kit. Um, so it was very much a family outing. It was a family kind of uh, family weekend. We did it as a family. Um, we would travel together. My little brother would be on the road with us as well, who's a mega inspiration. <laughs> you definitely got to speak to him one day. Um, born with cerebral palsy um, when I was seven and is a speaker today. So he's, and racing, he's done, he's defined all the odds. And wow. uh, even though he's seven years younger than me, he's still very much an inspiration. But the thing with my dad was, he was, he, be, he was my manager all the way till I was like 20. I got to, we got to Formula One and he was, he, he worked so hard. He, his work ethic for me was, that that's, was inspiring for me seeing how hard he worked. The time he gets up in the morning, the little sleep that he would have, end of his day in the garage, working on the go-kart, preparing for the weekend, packing up the truck and um, getting us to where we are, mechanicing, learning to be a better mechanic and, and still weighing all these different things. It was quite phenomenal to see. Um, but I think it, it was difficult for him to then show me love. Sometimes you just want a hug from your dad, you know, or when you're facing these things, you want to be able to be embraced. But um, when I think I got to when I was 22, 23, it got really intense when I got to Formula One 
because all of a sudden you're thrown into, you go through karting and cars. You don't go to school to, to learn to mm. speak to the media. You, mm -hmm. You're literally thrown into the pit. And at the time I didn't have management up other than my dad. Um, I sent my mom booked flights and trips, but um, I didn't have PR. I didn't have um, anybody to help protect me or prepare me mm -hmm. for things. Driving, I was good. I was set. <laughs> but in these things is where a lot of mistakes happened. Um, you've got the the kind of all the media tension and you have to, so you're just learning on the go, which mm -hmm. was very really difficult for a youngster, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and also I just, you wanted to try and live some sort of normal normal life, but nothing's normal for you at the time. And I think for me and my dad, we just, we were really bumping heads at one stage. It's like, I really just want you to be my dad so we can, let's go and have fun. Let's go and have a laugh. But we hadn't had that for a long, long time. And so um, eventually I, I decided to set part ways with my dad and I was like, I'm going to start making some of the decisions for myself and the mistakes that I'm going to need to make. And there was definitely a period of time where we spoke less. Um, but we both have worked so hard to come back together. And we have one of the greatest, you know, he's the first person I want to call when I finish a race. Um, because I know he knows what it's like. He was there from day one. And so, you know, he's been to the last two races with me. He's probably going to come to the next one. There's days where I do feel like I'm not enough. There's days where I don't feel like I'm good enough. And people will be like, yeah, but you've won seven world titles. And I'm like, yeah, but still there's days where I mm. question, no, you still got it. You still, are you st can you still be the best? Yes, you can. And so I have to just always, I'm having that conversation with myself often, but my dad's also there. Sometimes I'll say something that's maybe not the most positive and he'll be the one there just reaffirming, no, you've got this, believe in yourself. And it's so important for people to have people like that around them. Mm. And I support myself, I surround myself with other people positive people as well and we continue i think it's all our job to lift every as many you know everyone up right i want everyone around me to win and yeah um and to become the best versions of themselves so no thank you for sharing that as well thank you for opening up about that because yeah i think the relationships we have with our parents are just so significant when it comes to achievement and success and when you start doing sport at your level even at an early age wins and losses starts becoming so important. So win and loss is important in everyone's life in the sense that everyone has it in exams and school and things like that, which we'll talk about in a second as well. But for you, you're having it in a very over way. Like you have one, two, three, and then you have everyone else. And, and how have you kind of worked with that since you're young? Because I can imagine that your psychology can become very much like if you win, things are great. If you lose, things are bad. How have you kind of processed that as time's gone on? And was there a time when it was unhealthy and difficult and has it got better or is it something you're always working on? So on one side of things, you know, I struggled at that school, as I said. So I, the teachers would write these reports that I was not focused or I wasn't doing well. And, and I remember the fear of that report every year. And I try so hard to do well. And then these teachers, I don't know if teachers out there realize when they write those reports, what's happening back at home, whether you have an abusive uh, household yeah. or, you know, the, the stress of that was, was difficult. I feel in racing, if I, if I would win, I could see a smile on my dad's face and it was really like, okay, if I do well at this, I know that mm -hmm. I'll be accepted, you know? Um, but I've got to work double hard to be, I've got to always be first. I always laugh about the whole, if you're not first, you're last. Because <laughs> I'm literally, whilst that's obviously I've not been first my whole life, first was everything. Yeah. Um, in order to be accepted, in order to fit in, and maybe to be appreciated. Um, not only in within my relationship perhaps with my dad, but then also around my friends. And it wasn't until I got older I realized it's about the bigger picture. But when you have success, it's so short-lived. It's like, it really is really short-lived. You win a race, then you go back home and you have big, as a racing driver, you know, the weekend is so intense, you've seen it. There's so much energy, so much, it's really, really a, a stressful environment for everyone that's working within it. Then you go home and there's a huge come down like one or two days later. And you're trying to balance those emotions, that emotional roller coaster. Um, and learning to kind of channel that and figure out ways to keep it balanced mm. with, a, with your routine and those sorts of things has been really key for me. But I think during 
uh, the last couple, last few years, really understanding that it's about the bigger picture. Um, I'm fighting for something far greater than winning a race. I'm really fighting for change in the world. You know, we're more divided than ever. I would say it's devastating. I can't watch the news. It's devastating. There's just so much happening. But there are so many great people out there that are doing really great things, and I want to be one of, the, I want to be a part of that mm. inspirational energy bubble that people like yourselves are, are a part of. Um, because we want to, we need to create a brighter future. We need to create better future leaders. Look how many, look how bad our leaders are that are in governments. You know, like mm. we need to be inspiring the next generation of, of, of thought leaders um, that are positive and. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to be a part of every day. So I'm really trying to focus on my intentions, as you were talking about, like setting your intentions each day. Um, I'm trying to learn new tools that I didn't have when I was a kid. I didn't have, I didn't know about yoga. I didn't know about meditation. Um, I didn't have podcasts to listen to, good people to listen to and, uh, and aspire to kind of help me put on the right path. So yeah, um, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. And there's almost not enough time here on this planet, right? We're here for such a short time, really, in the scale of the universe. Yeah, but I think you're one of those people that, you know, and that's when we first connected, that was one of the biggest reasons for me that I saw you using your platform for a bigger purpose. I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Like, that's so interesting to me because that's a choice too. I think today we kind of assume that if someone has a platform or if someone's you know, number one in their field, or if someone's got followers that they should talk about stuff. We kind of assume that anyone who has followers should talk about stuff. First of all, I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of people choose not to, uh, but, but you were someone that stood out to me massively where I was just like, wow, this person's really not just winning on, on the track, but is thinking about how winning on the track transfers to what you can do off the track because of the influence because of your network because of your impact and i find that to be really the missing link for so many people because i always say that your purpose is something not just that makes you happy it's when you use what makes you happy to serve other people like when you use it to, to impact other people's lives when did that drop for you like when did that click for you like were you ever I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a transition when you're saying that, well, you know, winning, like maybe get the nod from my dad and obviously I was bullied and then I'm winning, but then I'm number one at something. Like, was there a point at which number one didn't satisfy you? Or was there a point at which the success that came from it or, or you didn't actually have to get dissatisfied. You just found that there was a better way to be successful. Does that make sense? The part that was striking when you're just saying that for me, it was like, I feel like we often live in fear mm. of what people think, um, how you're going to be judged, how you're going to be received. If you, if you're very outspoken, you're going to lose your job. You're going to be fired. I've always been an outspoken person. I think that's just been a quality. I've never been a follower. Mm. Um, I don't like to conform to how people expect what people, what people expect from you. As I said, I was having a success and I was like, okay, now I'm on the, I'm at the top. What can I do with it? Yeah. And there are so many causes, there's so many problems out there and there's so many, so many amazing causes and which one, you know, there's only one of you. So like, what, where do you put the focus? And that's take, it took a long, long time to really find what that was for me. I think for me, education was something that I felt extremely passionate about because I'd, I'd been out to India, I'd been out into some of the really poorest places like Manila and seeing young kids who are like us begging for food and not having the same opportunities. And for me, that was, that broke my heart and realized how privileged we are and how fortunate we are. But I was like, I want to be working with people out there that are trying to create more, you know, there's over a hundred million kids that don't have access to school mm -hmm. or education. So how can I get involved in that? So align yourself with people that do. But I think I was, I was winning and it was giving me that tip of happiness, but then I would kind of drop back down to, normality and there was something missing and it was that purpose really mm. or understanding what that purpose is and understanding what why you've been put here why you've been given the, the platform that you've that you've been given why were the only you know only people of color this whole time through it all and when I started speaking about 
um, diversity, people are like, oh, you want to get more people of color in as, as racing drivers? There's only 20 of us. So I was like, no, it's this 40,000, 40, 50,000 jobs. There's thousands of engineering jobs in the background and there's such a lack of diversity coming through. I want to be a part of shifting that narrative and shifting that conversation and having people be question themselves and have those difficult conversations with, with people. So I first, I just started by having those difficult conversations with my boss. And one of the things he brings up that he said that hit him hard. I said, have you ever thought of, uh, as a white person walking into the paddock, into the race weekend paddock mm -hmm. and being the only white person there? He's like, he's like, I hadn't even thought of that. And I said, well, that's what it's like for someone like me. When I'm in the room, you noticed, you noticed that out of 50 people in a meeting, you're the only person, the black person there. And it's not because we are less mm -hmm. it's because there are these barriers within society through education that are limiting people to be the best they can be mm -hmm. so my job is to be empowering and uh, improving representation i'm really really passionate like black equity as well so that's why i got involved with the denver broncos denver broncos yeah yeah and usually when i'm in conversation with sponsors or companies i'm like hey so what it, how diverse is your team what are you doing about diversity and inclusion how are you creating a better work workspace for people? That's what I want to be a part of. I, the success can come later and that's that will be along the way. But if you're not asking those questions or you're not tackling those issues, then we're not aligned. Yeah. And so all the, pretty much every partner that we have, we have a lot of partners within our team, I've asked these really difficult questions and they're like, oh, you know what, but we can do more. I'm like, well, let's do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I've, think I've grown very close with my like Mercedes Benz and yeah. Daimler. They've been so open that we changed the car from silver to black in 2020. And as again, I said to them, like the car's been silver forever. It's always been silver arrows. And I was like, imagine if we changed the car to black, what that could, you know, us turning up and arriving is how you show up. And it's how, you know, imagine the message we can send. And we had the black car for the whole year and we didn't even really talk much about it. We just let it be mm. and we won with it. And that's when I won my seventh world title with that car. So that's beautiful. Now that must have felt special. It was honestly my whole life flashed by my, you know, that last lap in Turkey, my whole life, like all the struggles, the questioning whether you were going to make it or not, just all those doubts, all those fears kind of flashed by me, by, you know, through my eyes and came across the line. And I was like, I did it. And I want the kids out there to know that you can do it too. You know, um, so that's why I try and like every day, just try to be encouraging of kids. You yeah, know? yeah. Do you do you sometimes feel that we were talking about this a bit earlier that you know in other sports we get to see the emotions and the expressions of players that we love or you know anyone who's on the court or the field or the pitch. Whereas with you, because like we don't get to see that in your eyes in your last lap like that. We can only hear it today, which is why I'm so grateful to have this moment because I obviously, whenever, I, whenever I'm sitting down with someone who's a high performer like you, it's obvious that there's so much emotion and preparation and power, but with racing specifically, you just don't get to see that. Do you sometimes feel that the only people that can truly relate to you are the people you compete with? Because I feel like it's like you said, there's only 20 of you that are racing anyway. It's lonely anyway. 99% of people in the world have no idea what it feels like to drive a car as fast as you do in the way you do in, in any comparison. Do you sometimes feel that the only people you can relate to are the people that are racing against you? And then do you kind of feel, is there a loneliness in that experience or is that kind of like a power in that as well? Definitely the other drivers I do feel that there's more, we have a lot more in common than we think, but mm -hmm. we're so competitive and a lot of us have our defense. Like you want to beat the guy, but yeah. then you like the guy, you might like the person outside the car, but you can't show that. <laughs> like there's this whole psychological battle you're having with yourself and getting away yeah. with yourself a lot of the time. So I, I really feel like as an older driver, I'm trying to be more like reaching out to <laughs> youngsters and um, because they're the future, you know, um, and I'm excited to see some of these younger drivers that are coming through are so, so talented. I don't know if they've got the best structure around them. Like I may not, I, like I didn't necessarily have the ultimate structure that I perhaps have now. So just try to be a kind of, um, a positive light to them. But 
naturally none of them are, uh, are black and none of them have necessarily faced the same as me, but they've faced their own challenges and, and thinks about respecting that with, with, within everybody. And I've tried to be, create allies necessarily like in having the difficult conversations with some of them. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm so grateful for, I've had a couple of them that really took the knee with me in 2020. Mm. Um, just on that, you know, my dad was going back to the house my dad, my yeah. dad like never let me cry as a kid. He said, there's a sign of weakness. Like, don't let me ever see you shed a tear. So I remember just holding back through those difficult times as a kid, holding back most of that stuff. In 2020, I cried. I hadn't cried for at least, I think, at least 10 years, maybe more. It was There was a lot of bottled up stuff that came up that I had not realized that I didn't even know about suppressing a, a pain or a feeling. So I remember kind of being on my knees thinking, you know, what is happening in the world? I've got to... I've got to be outspoken. I've got to take that chance because if I don't do it, then no one's going to do it. Mm. If I don't, if I don't take the knee, if I don't let people like me know that I care and I hear you and I'm, I'm with you and I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to risk it all. I don't care if my partners want to drop me because I don't want to be associated with this narrative. I don't, I'm like, and I literally let go of all the fear and that's why I went, came so forward with it. And I know it's not easy for everyone to do that. Um, but I just want to really and try to encourage people out there to to be themselves, to speak out if they've got a problem. If they're seeing something within the work working environment or experiencing something, you've got to be outspoken about it. And there's a right way to do it. But the first day I was going to take the knee, I remember I, I didn't feel like I could tell my team. I was like, because I, I felt that they wouldn't understand how important it is for me to do this this day. So I remember I had a, my Black Lives Matter a shirt hidden and I just wore it out there and I, I went ahead with it. And so no one knew? No one knew. Wow. But every, uh, the sport had built, had made all these t-shirts like um, We Race is One yeah. slogan. And they gave these t-shirts to all the, to everybody. I was like, I'm not wearing that. That's not what this is about. Yeah. And so this is what I'm doing. And this was around George Floyd, right? The, yeah. The murder of George Floyd. Yeah. And Afterwards, my team were like, well, why don't you, if you just told us, we could have prepared better. But I had this fear that they would try and stop me, perhaps. Mm. But that was just a fear. Um, they've been massively supportive through the whole thing. I, my hope was that, you know, kids would be watching me like, what is, what is, what is that? Why is he taking the knee? What, what, what does that shirt mean? What is going on, Dad, Mom? And then the, the parents being in an awkward position having to explain it, maybe. Mm. But I think what was really encouraging for me, I think, when we started really getting into the whole diversity and inclusion. We did the research. There was only 3% out of 2,000 people in the team. There's 3% diversity. So since then, we've been on this mission. The team have started new projects. We've discovered that they, the sport generally hires from one group of universities, which is not diverse. And if there are any young black students that go there, they're twice as unlikely to be hired when they come out compared to their counterparts and also paid less. So there's like this, all these things that perhaps people didn't know. That's and the so, Hamilton Commission, right? Yeah, that was the reason Hamilton, too. yeah. And that just was interesting to, to experience that. And now, now we're working on like a diversity charter that all the teams have to be a part of. And it's not mine, it's for the sport. And it's to encourage those teams because you, there's still not any diversity within, you know, if you look at Ferrari, they don't have hardly any. There's, most teams don't. Um, but when I go back to my team, to the factory, normally in our marketing department wasn't very diverse initially. And I walked in after the pandemic and I started seeing such a more diverse group of people. I was really quite emotional because I was like, oh my God, there's, I'm starting to see change. But you don't see that on TV. Yeah. So when I talk to the, to the bosses of the sport, I'm like, hey, you know, there's all white men facing, oh, and, and me facing the camera at the start of the race. Where are the women? Where are the people of color? We've got to be showing so the young kids are watching and they're like, oh, there's a place for me there. I can be there. Mm -hmm. I can be an engineer. I can be a mechanic or whatever it may be. And even for young girls, oh, I can be a racing driver or an engineer or strategist or yeah. whatever, you know? So uh, representation is so, so key to inspiring these, the young youth. Especially in these industries that they already have less access to, right? Like that's the point that it's not just, it's not just representation because you want them to even have the opportunity. It's the fact that there's just no access point, which is what you're trying to create. I think what's, what I find really 
beautiful about you doing it is you're doing it though when you're like, I'm having all my emotions come up at the same time as trying to be a voice for other people. And when you're saying like, I'm, I'm taking a knee because I know I have to make a stand externally, but internally you're taking a knee because so much of your own stuff from years ago is coming back up. Like that must be quite hard when you're, that's, that strikes me as something that's really inspiring about what you did is that you were going through your own healing at the same time as trying to do healing for the world. There is so much healing to do, right? And I was completely oblivious that, that I needed healing. I needed to really peel back some of those layers. Um, I think for people that turn into, tune into racing, you mentioned earlier on, but when you, we arrive, everything's set up. We, there is work that we're doing in the background that naturally people don't see. They just see a show. But there is an unbelievable amount of work that goes on in the background. Um, when I talk to people that talk about how much weight you lose, in the, but they're like, yeah, you just sit in the car and you drive. <laughs> Um, there's this huge psychological and emotional roller coaster that you're going through that it would be really hard for people to comprehend. And you mentioned about all these other athletes, you see their faces in other sports, you can't see because we've got a helmet on. But you go through this roller coaster ride in the race and then you get out and they, the camera's right in your face. You're not prepared for that. Your emotions are shot, particularly if you failed or feel like you failed. And you don't always answer the right way. If you wear your, sh your heart on your sleeve, People that don't necessarily like that necessarily always. People take advantage of that. So then you build up all these protection mechanism, mm. mechanisms that's not necessarily you and at the core, but what be the safest thing for you. You know what I mean? Like I read something the other day about it's like three steps of you and there's one, the one of which you present, your, uh, who you present, then it's you and your, who you are to you and your family and friends. And then there's one, the part of you, the real you, that no one ever gets to see. And I think just today in today's world, it's so vicious on social media. It's the media can be, you know, can really tear you apart. Mm -hmm. And you build up, you know, like you, when you make a mistake in something you say in the media and you're ridiculed for it, you never do it again. So you build up and you go more and more in your shell and you become harder for people to really relate to. But I think for me, what I've realized in these last few years is really peeling back those layers and, you know, letting people know that I grew up in a council estate. I, you know, I've lived on the sofa with my, uh, my, my parents. We've had those struggles. Um, the successful people out there you see, they too have had those things where we need to show the young kids who are going through that same thing that, oh, I c if he can get there or they can get there, then it must be possible for me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like being... Showing your like vulnerability, that's something that I really struggled to 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 do for a yeah. long, long time. And um like today that's something I think I'm I'm a lot more open than I've ever ever been. Yeah. I'm not living in fear every day. And that's like the most that's the most empowering th thing I think for me personally. I'm living a much happier life because I'm I'm a lot more open. Yeah. It's liberating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's liberating when you finally feel like you're not trapped or, or you're not being held or, hi yeah, or hiding. Yeah, or hiding. My favorite quote is from Maya Angelou when she said, we are all powerful beyond measure. Mm. And that really hit home also for me that that's my favorite quote because, and I have it tattooed, because really we are so, we do limit ourselves. We get in our own way, right? Along with the other things that get in our way, but a lot of our fear stops us from driving forwards, from progressing. And that's why like I do the craziest things. I, I jump out of planes. Yeah, you've done what, 80 jumps? Yeah, like, so I like just, yeah. just I love challenging myself and doing things even though there's maybe fear there, but overcoming that fear is like, it's the best feeling when you overcome it and you realize that it was all just a bunch of nonsense in your head. <laughs> I want to encourage, so all well, my friends, I'm like, hey, let's go and do this today. They're like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> My dad, I mean, I think as a kid, my dad was like, is he really my son? Because I wouldn't do any of these things. And even still today, um, I still find that, and he's actually done skydiving with me, my dad actually. Yeah. He said he would never do it, but he did it. So, <laughs> But driving 200 miles per hour is probably one of the scariest things that you do all the time. Like that's well, for not people, for you anymore. No, but as in, well, that thing is I never had that fear Yeah, uh, as a kid. And I was just never, you know, I think if you go on a ski slope and you see these kids coming by, the yeah. kids are generally fearless, right? Yeah. But I think as you go get older, yes, you yes. start, you hurt yourself a little bit. You start protecting yourself more and more. But I just don't have that 
I think uh, I feel like that was something that just wasn't necessarily put in me. Yeah. I'm terrified of spiders. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing. But when I'm doing 200 miles an hour, that's actually when I'm most at peace, I would say. Yeah. It's like I'm, I'm like flowing. It's like my, that's my element. And that's why I, like, I love doing what I do. It's going to be really, really hard when I stop racing. I've been doing it for 30 years. I'm 37. I've been racing 30 years. And when you stop, like what, what's going to match that? Nothing's going to ever probably a match being in the stadium or being at the race and being at the pinnacle of the sport, being at the front of the grid or, or coming through the grid, that emotion that I get there. When I do stop, that will be a, there'll be a big hole. Yeah. So I'm trying to generally focus on things, find things that are going to replace that, that are also going to be just as rewarding. And that's like mission 44 for me, meeting kids at schools, having these conversations with families and parents who clearly are going through difficult times and want to create the best opportunity for their kids, encouraging them that, like, it's okay, I've been there too. Look where I got. So you can get there. It's just got to work through it. That's for me, the, that's way more rewarding than winning the race. Yeah. So much more. Yeah. That's, I'm so grateful and I'm so happy that everyone's going to uh, getting to hear this. I felt you're the only, and, and I know, you, you know, you're talking about when that happens, but it's brilliant that you're planning already because you can see how, so many athletes mentally when they know their career has somewhat of a shelf life or a somewhat of a, a time span, like it's so hard. It's, it just completely, but I remember you're reminding me of when I had the fortune of sitting down with Kobe Bryant and I said, sat down with him when he'd already retired wow. when I interviewed him. Oh, uh, so great. I was, I'm so jealous. He was one of those people that was not upset being retired. He loved it because he knew that his mission for him was to make these short movies and make all these uh, sports-based content to inspire kids to tell their stories and to help them find better stories. And so it's exactly what you're saying, where he wasn't, he's one of those people that I've met. He was not sad about, he was so happy. He was so pumped. That's because, what I'm working towards. Yeah, because he he knew that he had a mission and he had a purpose and he'd gone and won an Oscar for a, a short movie that he'd made and you know, he was creating content to inspire kids and that's where his heart was. And of course, watching his daughters play. And so- I'm super inspired by him. Yeah. But yeah, like when you said that, that's what I remembered. And and he was in the same boat. He was like, I'd always wanted to script write. I never had time to script write. He said, I was always playing basketball. And he goes, but then I started script writing and I got a coach and then I was writing and getting better as a writer. And I was, yeah, because I think when I've spoken yeah. to other athletes, that we focus so much on that being the best you can be in that one thing that the other things that you also love, like if it's playing an instrument or if it's writing scripts, like it all falls, everything falls away. And yeah. um, how can you compartmentalize staying in the, in the zone, in the focus lane, but also building up some of those other skills and discovering other passions, you know, people's, you've heard people tell LeBron, shut up and dribble. Like, yeah that's there there's a lot of people put you in a box and say this you can only do one thing but I, as i've seen and spoken to some people that are active and retired a lot of them say when particularly when they're retired that they everything kind of fell apart like everything fell to the <clears> ground <throat> they had nothing to back it up with and they hadn't discovered what they're doing next so then yeah. they go through this emotional journey um of of discovery but it takes time so i'm like trying to learn from those things and applying them and find the other things that I'm passionate about. So I generally feel today that I have lots of things in the pipeline that when I do stop, it's going to be like so grateful, <laughs> but I have something better that I'm yeah. moving on to. Yeah. Um, but I, I have no doubts that I'll all, me and my dad will always have to go to the go-kart track or something, <laughs> you know, I'm always going to be competitive. Yeah, I can't, yeah. I, that's literally a strain in my DNA that's just never going to going to shift. I'm com- we're competitive at everything. I'm happy to hear that. It's, 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 I'm sure that's refreshing. It's great for people to also hear that even to inspire young people or inspire anyone who's got to a place in their career where they know that there's a certain moment where things are going to wind down, but then they're going to transition. I think, I don't think we celebrate the transitions enough in life and life is made up of transitions. Absolutely. And people everything. think that it's maybe less or something, but it's, yeah. it's, it's not about that. Yeah, exactly. So it's fascinating. You found that. What are some of these like you said, like, oh, I'm doing, you know, I've been doing jumps, I've been doing this with my friends. What are some of the routines that you put into place to help you manage your mindset? Because I feel like you're, you said that being at 200 miles per hour for the duration of a race is like being in flow for you. That means you're extremely comfortable with your own thoughts, extremely comfortable with being in a, 
high stress, high pressure environment, but being just with your own self. Talk to us about how you, I mean, it sounds like that's always been the case, but what have you done to become more and more comfortable with that? Yeah, I think naturally there's a natural ability, right? But um, like being able to focus for an hour and 45 minutes without making mistakes and- <laughs> that's, in, that's literally insane. It's unbelievable. Dealing with the yeah. pressures. Um, I, a friend actually asked me last night, cause I talk about, we lose a lot of race, uh, a lot of weight in the race. Yes. Like sometimes you can lose up to 10 pounds, like four kilos. And people are like, whoa, I need to be a race, particularly in America. They're like, oh, I need to be a racing driver um, for the weight loss. But with this question that my friend asked me the other day, it's like, where does the, where does the weight go? Like, yeah. because my suit doesn't, uh, cause afterwards I weigh less, but the, I'm like, so it must evaporate somewhere. <laughs> so I'm not, I've got to figure out where all that weight actually truly goes. Cause it also obviously is in, in sweat, but that's like messed my mind up now. Um, but the suit definitely is obviously a little bit heavier, but um, it's about gaining tools. And I think as when I was younger, I didn't have, I knew how to arrive at the race. I channeled the, so the, the, this emotion that I had through whatever those difficulties were into my driving. So I was laser focused. Like if you watch a video for me when I was five years old on Blue Peter, you'll see I'm just laser focused. But um, being able to control emotions, being able to be calm and present, staying centered, there are loads of obviously different methods that people can use. The things that I try to, that I've started to incorporate over the years more in my life is things like stretching, uh, things like um, yoga and meditation has been a real, that for me was something that I never thought that, that I kind of turned a blind eye to it when I was younger. I thought that's not going to be helpful, but being able to be sit still for a second and listen to the noises around you um, and understand you more and tap into that kind of inner child or whatever it may be. That's for me been taking that moment for yourself each day, treating yourself with love and being kind to yourself, you know, because I think for a long time I wasn't kind to myself. Mm. And that's been a process. Uh, doing things that, being purposeful and, and having real set intentions each day, no, no matter how big or small. And, you know, when I wake up and looking in the mirror, brushing your teeth, then stop for a second and say, okay, this, today's going to be the day. Today's going to be great. Um, and no matter what you're faced with, you know, just whatever you come out with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking to yourself. Also speaking to people, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. I think as a kid, as I said, I didn't feel like I could speak to people. I, I didn't feel like I could tell my mom about these experiences. I felt embarrassed. I couldn't tell my dad. So I thought he would feel, think less of me. I couldn't talk to any of the teachers, couldn't tell my, most of my friends, most of them, uh, weren't particularly of color. So, but finding learning to be open and speak to people, find mm -hmm. someone to speak to, whether it's a therapist, whatever, that's, that's been a huge, um, help. Um, I don't necessarily have a therapist as such yeah, with someone yeah. that I'm able to then just have sh shooter shit with basically. And, yeah. Um, and confide in and trust, like trust has been something that I've never had. I didn't trust anybody through those experiences I had as a kid. Mm. And it's been very, very hard to build trust with people, but creating allies, finding things that are that you have in common with people like my boss for example him and i just breaking each other down and then just having realizing that we're similar in many many ways mm -hmm. but also very different but that's not what should divide us we can then be allies and so that's why we're working on being the most diverse team we're working on pushing we have we've started ignite which is about getting you know improving that pipeline of into motorsport for people um from underserved communities and there's so much work to do you're doing it though man uh, i'm trying to i'm yeah. trying to and you know to the point you were asking earlier like has has enough been done absolutely not in the industry yeah it's in like you don't feel that yeah and it's not only in either industry it's, yeah. it's everywhere and is that your goal to, to sort in the industry and then expand out or you're starting you're starting across the board anyway yeah yeah that well with the team with where it's we started an organization called ignite which we both fund and that is focused on the sport, motorsport in general, but um, Mission Forty Four is focused on a much, you know, societal challenges and barriers and and education, and um, that's our fo focused in the UK at the moment. But I want to bring that over to the states. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, hopefully by at least twenty twenty four. Also, just been to Africa, and 
there is so much beauty there and I, I really, really want to have an impact, you know, really want to help there as well. So yeah, um, we will continue to expand, but we're one of the, f- one of the few black founding nonprofit organizations in UK and with um, Black CEO, for example, a very diverse uh, group of people. Um, and just having those conversations with people of just what a diverse workforce means and how that be- can benefit you when you have people from different backgrounds mm. all coming up with a diverse um, diverse thought and creation. It's That's how you have more success. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a no-brainer when you hear it and you're just like, wow, that makes so much sense and creativity is better and you, you'd be able to come up with far more innovative ideas and you've got so many more cultures now being celebrated and involved. And I, I feel like it's it's interesting to me that the world hasn't caught on with that yet. Like it's it's interesting that even despite there being progress, there's not enough progress. But what what is the block? Like what is the stop? Is it a mindset? Is it just habits and laziness? Like what is the actual, like if you got to the core of it from everyone you've been speaking to, like what are you what is the issue? Is the issue that, yeah, is the issue just laziness and just, oh, this is the way things have always been? Or is it, or is there actually like a setup? I don't have the yeah. answer to it. No, I yeah. I ask that question all the time and I come up with lots of different theories in my mind. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm like, maybe people don't just don't care. Mm. Um, maybe people's problems are so big that they don't have time to focus on other things. And mm. it's hard enough just to do the thing that you're focused on or just overcoming the issue that you're overcoming. So how am I going to have more time to yeah. to speak about these things? Why should I take the risk and risk my next step? And so I feel like it's about learning to be selfless, right? Mm. And um, which is difficult to do if you're not being loving yourself and not in a good place. Yeah. So I think it all comes to us at hopefully at a time, uh, at a certain point in our lives. Um, but also, you know, we live in a time where like social media is so it's such a dangerous, it's such a powerful tool, but it's also can be so dangerous and so dividing. And I see people out there today and there's people that I admire that I'm, fo- that, that I would follow. And I'd be like, how are they projecting something that's not necessarily helpful for you, for people out there? How are they projecting? They're not using this platform to be more inspirational or, or be more positive. And there's loads that are, but then I don't, you can't judge you. So that's their journey. All you can continue to do is try to, you know, with that Maya Angelou quote is about being, shining your light as bright as you can possibly get it and hope that by doing it, you, I think you automatically uh, encourage the people around you to want to do the same. Mm-hmm. And I never truly understood that till I see the team that I work with, how we all inspire each other, how with this year, for example, we've had the, you know, 2022 has been one of the hardest years for us as a team. Um, as we didn't build a great car and we had our struggles as many people do and how we've had to all come closer and the relationship I've had with people like I've worked with this team for 10 years and there's conversations we've had this year people have opened up like they've never opened up before people have cried Uh, like it's been it's been beautiful to see and I feel like we're some a, a far better team than we've ever been before because we're living with intention we're actually talking about impact everyone in the team has gone and had diversity inclusion training no one's been kind of like i'm not i'm not going through that class why do i have to go and learn what diversity and inclusion is about i'm i'm white it doesn't impact me you know mm-hmm. people are like i understand it doesn't i wouldn't necessarily notice it but i want to understand it more so i can be better in my working environment yeah. and it's been unbelievable that's amazing also leaders within our sport are now and where we are on the road to being a more diverse and more inclusive sport but I think my job is to continuously make sure that it, that that same e- the effort that we're putting in now doesn't kind of fall away and become kind of, you know, just because it was um, trending. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is actually something that's on the top of the list. Sustainability is on the top of our list. And like real true core values. We don't go out of our way, or, you know, because a lot of people, are, uh, it's very easy to kind of be led by money or yeah. success. Um, but making sure you stick core to, to your core values is so true, so yeah. important. It goes back to what you said, though, that that's what real leaders do. Like, leaders don't follow what's trending. Like, leaders are focused on transformation, and then they're dedicated to transformation, and they're going to keep doing it until they see a change, whereas followers follow trends, 
and oh it's not trending now it doesn't matter we'll focus on something else but you know it, obviously it's so clear uh, just listening to you today and it's amazing because and that's why I'm so glad I've had this opportunity to talk to you because I can hear just how deeply dedicated you are to this and how it's at your core it's like it's everything that comes out of your pores today is just you know which is which is really special to see a value being embodied like to empower other people you have to embody the value first it doesn't just you don't just go around empowering people and so to hear how your soul and heart is like completely a sponge for this stuff and then to wanting to go and share it with the world it's really remarkable man oh, thank you yeah, well i mean this i've I'm by far perfect. No, I, yeah, no. And I think that's like, it's not about being perfect. It's about just every day, one step at a time, trying to be better, trying to do more. Yeah. And um, I'm learning a lot about myself. I've had to break myself down in order to be able to be better. And what do you mean by breaking yourself down? Uh, well, just when you, when I told you about like all those barriers you put up over yes, time yes. to protect yourself and then kind of like knocking those barriers down. Yes. And it's enabled me to connect with more people. It's enabled me to realize my place in the world and i don't feel like i don't belong anymore i feel like uh you know i've got a place and i've got a purpose and that's and i think a lot of people are struggling to find that purpose but it's okay you'll you will find it do not give up keep getting up you know like just keep saying those things to yourself and you will eventually find it and you know you're already living in your purpose and are having such a huge impact on so many people you know telling stories which uh is it's amazing to see um, I started this production company inspired by like Kobe and so many out there, but stories for me, storytelling, I watch a lot of movies. I don't know about you, but yeah, I love movies, especially sports movies. Yeah. yeah. Like when I go home, <laughs> I'll like, I, you know, order takeaway or make myself yeah. some pasta or something like that. And then I put the plate in front of me and I can't eat till I found something to watch. Yeah. <laughs> like my, my escape is watching the movie and I always like to find something hopefully inspiring. Yeah. Um, same. But what, the reason I created this um, production company is because, you know, until recently we didn't have any people of color as superheroes. We, I think these stories, storytelling is so, so important for people out there, for inspiring people. And and I want to make sure that in, in everything that I do, every project that I work on is with a diverse mm. workforce. Like I'm doing this Form 1 movie with um, Brad Pitt and Joe Kaczynski. And, um, but my job is to make sure... Who, that is diverse behind the camera as it is on screen. The story is empowering and uplifting. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, there's no BS in terms of the <laughs> racing and, uh, and hopefully uh, one kid will watch it and yeah. or more and feel empowered to go and do something great. Absolutely. I love that, man. I'm so glad you're doing that because when you said, do I like movies? The movie that came to my mind was uh, Race. Have you seen Race? Mm -hmm, of course. Yeah, yeah. So like that, the story is unbelievable, but when you watch the movie as well, it's unbelievable to see what Jesse Owens did. Like to think that he had to go. I can't even imagine. I can't, you know, you just can't imagine. If anyone's not seen the movie, you have to go see the you movie. You have to like, go and like, see like, it. It's just one of those movies that's like, how do you do that? Like, how do you go and race in Nazi Germany? Like I have like, I, no It must have been terrifying. Terrifying. And, you know, there's, I mean, there's so many great stories like that that are out there that need telling. Yeah. Um, continuously telling. Yeah. 42 um, is another one. Yeah. 42 is awesome. Yeah, 42 is such a great movie. Um, but yeah, there are these, these really unique people out there. I think for me, being in this sport, being the only one and being the first is, that is, that has been lonely. Yeah. And that has been really, really a difficult thing to kind of understand and, and um, through my life. And there are many, many people like Jesse, for example, being the first and only at the time, you know, I've taken huge inspiration from him. Nelson Mandela was like, oh, he's one of my biggest, biggest inspirations. Yeah. Um, I was so, so fortunate to get to meet him when I was, what was I, 23 or something. Oh, wow. What was that like? Yeah. Ah, oh, it was mind blowing. I mean, when you, when you then, I got to Formula One and you have the success, all these things come and you don't even, you've dreamed of being a racing driver, but you didn't dream that all the other things, of all the other things that come along, yeah. like meeting other unbelievable people i went to nelson mandela's 90th birthday in london and i was sat on his table in this huge room full of like bill clinton was there like uh denzel washington was there open winfrey sat right next to me like all these people that you would never ever in a million years dream of think you would ever get to meet yeah and then you discover they're also just human beings with feelings and with emotions and with their own challenges but i was so young at the time it was it was 
I don't even recognize myself. When I look back at me seven years ago, I see a shell of me. And I think I look today and see myself and know myself so much more. Um, and that's, again, that's an empowering experience to be in. But yeah. I went into the room and met him and he sat at his chair. And it was like walking into, I was like God or like a king, <laughs> you know, and his silk shirt was, his aura was something, you could see his aura, his yeah. smile, he was beaming. That was the most, probably the most impactful day for me um, as, a, as a youngster. Wow. Lewis, it's unbelievable talking to you. I mean, what you've achieved on the track, off the track, and now I'm even more excited to see you continue to achieve uh, as your journey continues, because I, I'm going to say this, and I, d I don't say this often, and I genuinely, my team can vouch for it, and everyone else can listen back to any episode. I think you're the, one of the most on-purpose people I've ever interviewed. Ever. I appreciate that. No. Like, I, I, genuinely, like it just, there's nothing else that comes from your being apart from what your purpose currently is with Mission 44. And, and it's, it's really remarkable to meet someone who's so on purpose. I don't, I genuinely don't have that experience. And the only person you reminded me of was Kobe. He, he had it too. When, when I was around him, there was no, there was nothing else. It, it wasn't like he missed anything. He, he was at peace. It was, it was peace with purpose, you know, and, and you have that same aura and spirit from, from at least my experience. Thank you so much. It's um, so kind of you. Yeah. And I really mean that. I really mean that. It's incredible. So, uh, we, we end every episode with a fast five, which means every question has to be answered in one word to one sentence maximum. Okay. And we ask these same questions to every guest that's ever been on the show. I should so, be prepared for that because I've seen you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. The, 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 the first question is what's the best advice you've ever heard or received? I think it was literally my dad, uh, never give up. That's been like the slogan in the back of my mind every single day. The other one would be um, just that you always be learning. And that's what I learned from Nelson Mandela. He was mm. like, I'm 90 and I'm still learning today. And like, I was like, what, what can you tell me? It's like, I'm still learning today and it's okay to be learning. You're always going to be learning something new and growing. So, Wow, that's beautiful. I love it's not really that. like, wow, but like, no, that's you know, wow. pretty no, basic. But. No, but it's not, it's, it's powerful knowing he said that. Yeah. As in the fact that he said that on his 90th birthday, At 90, that yeah. is powerful because yeah, shoot. it's a long way to like, go. <laughs> yeah. And it's like a lot of people, I feel like a lot of people feel by 90, especially him, he has so much wisdom to share. Yeah. But the fact that his wisdom was, I'm just learning that's yeah. I'm still learning. That's pretty cool. All right. Mm. Second question. Uh, what's the worst advice you ever heard or received? Give up. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. Worst. Yeah. Literally yeah. the worst bit of advice. And it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, Advice. necessary advice but I, when I was younger there was other parents of other racing drivers I was racing against I remember this one guy and he's like you just you just don't have it you should just give up their parents were saying the that. parents the grown man in his 40s or 50s told me that and I was eight told nine, you told me yeah to my face and I remember just being so like what am I supposed to do with that what do you mean you give up what was the reason I would imagine because I was beating his kid <laughs> <laughs> maybe I don't know <laughs> I never really thought of what the reason would be. And I, the same with teachers, you know, yeah. what is this crap? You know, you're, you're terrible at this. You're never going to go yeah. to the next set. You're never going to amount to anything. Why are you even here? I had a parent, I had a teacher tell me that and I, and wow, it broke me down so much. Question number three, uh, how do you deal with loss and how do you deal with the win? I think success is, as I mentioned earlier, short lived success is there's a lot less learned in success. It's like mm. the tip of the iceberg. It's the losses and it's the failures and it's the continuously, just the perseverance that you're needed, that you need to do. Like, I love that image of the iceberg where you see the sea level and the iceberg on the top that everyone sees, but below is what people don't get to see. And it's, and it's relevant for every single person out there. Mm -hmm. It's finding your core. It's letting yourself know it's okay to feel the pain. It's okay to, to uh, accept that your failures and you know, put it on you. It's like, it's just another, another notch on your belt that is going to make you stronger. And just knowing that that is the case. Mm -hmm. I've failed so many more times than I've succeeded so many more and that people don't even know maybe necessarily about or see. And still today I'm making those failure, the, mm -hmm. those mistakes and, or, or making mistakes. But I know that that's, that's a part of the journey. That's, that's what I'm then harnessing and that's what's making me stronger. All right. Question number four out of five. Uh, what's something that you thought you valued, but you don't value anymore? Your material stuff. At some stage in your life, you realize they're not important. Mm -hmm. 
and we live in such a materialistic world. So learning to detach yourself from that and know that it's moments with special people, it's moments with your, with your family, with your loved ones, with your friends that are what you get to take with you when you stop, you know, when life comes to an end, right? I truly believe that it's those memories that are what, yeah, uh, memories of you also, which lingers, not what you had or what you were able to attain. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that was something that took me a long time to, to, to learn. And yeah. whilst I still have things I don't have, I've actually tried to unclutter my life because mm -hmm. we, um, I remember my dad used to call me into the garage and we used to go through all the crap that he would keep. I don't know if your dad, your parents do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, we just, <laughs> I remember he used to call me and it was the worst day ever when I had to help him clean out the garage. But we hold on to so many things, right? Yeah. Um, so just decluttering your life, yeah. making it more simple. Um, so that's why I like, I love to go and surfing. That's like the most tranquil kind of thing that I get to do. Sit in the ocean and sometimes just sit and wow. ponder about life, what I'm going to do next. And that's my getaway. I think people have to find that balance of work because if you just work, 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 and you don't replenish mm -hmm. your energy with positive so things, then you will just continue to be breaking yourself down. So I try and find that balance. I think everyone needs to do that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Surfing, skydiving, those are yours. Uh, fifth and final question. If you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? Holy crap. Uh, the one of the things that I'm like, I struggle with every day is, and it's just how life is. And it's been the way for thousands of years that there is such a disparity between wealthy and, and the poor. And, you know, you still, when you drive around LA, there's still so many people living on the streets. There should, you shouldn't be able to have billions, right? I think there should, there should be a limit to how much you can have because there's enough to go around to everyone. So somehow creating a law that creates more equality. Yeah, and equal access to every, for everyone, you know. Um, I don't know how that you would implement, implement that law. That's all good. But like, geez, man, I've met kids that are starving. Yeah, same. And you think, oh, God, like, how are we? We are so, so lucky, so many of us. Um, and knowing that and not taking advantage of, of your everyday um, is so, so important. It does. What law would you change? It does. No, I, I think that's beautiful. That's, I mean... We've, yeah, I mean, now, now you've flipped it on me. Right? Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, see, I see what you did there. Uh, if I had to create a law in the world that everyone had to follow, this is at least my today answer, and maybe it would change as well, is it kind of, and it's inspired by what we're talking about. I think, I, I wish at school the law was that every child had to learn about emotional mastery to understand how to understand other people's emotions and understand their emotions and take that into consideration when making decisions. And if every child was given that exposure to emotional mastery, then people would just have tools of how to deal with their own pain and someone else's pain and, and how to deal with when your parents are going through pain. Because I feel like pain is the issue we have any pain today. That's and so good, man. I yeah, told you so not to come no, up with something even no, greater. No, no, but it's inspired you're by you. It's, you're so right. You it's know? inspired by you. It's going yeah. back to education. It's, That's why like when you go to school, you don't learn all the, the they don't prepare you enough for what's to come. Not at all. And 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 that's tapping into mental health, as you mentioned. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And that's kind of where my purpose is, right? Like my purpose is that feeling of, you know, when I went on, lived as a monk, that's where I got exposed to emotional mastery. Like that was mm -hmm. the goal of what monk training was about. And I was 21, 22 when I did that. Wow. That's still young. It says a lot about that, shows a lot about you, yeah. Yeah, but it was it was kind of like a fascination that I had. I was just like, well, if I can't understand my mind, then how can you live life like that? That so so anyway, it comes from, but it comes from what you're saying that the education that needs to happen at a younger level. So, Lewis, it has been such a honor and a pleasure talking to you today, my man. It's, it's a huge responsibility that you've taken on for yourself, for the world, and I don't think there could be anyone better doing it. And I really, really hope that. Any help that I can offer, any help that my community can offer, please know that we're right here with you and thank you. right behind you. So thank you so uh, much. Our on purpose community, I know, would love to get behind anything that we can. Yeah, dude, I'm um, so uh, I'm so so grateful for the time you give me today. Yeah, and and again for like what you all you do, um, because you're having such a positive impact on so so many people, including me. You know, so when you perhaps don't realize it, you're yeah, you know, you're having such a big impact. 
Um, and I'm so grateful to you for that, mate. Thank you, man. It means the world coming from you, honestly. Thank you. Everyone who's been uh, listening and watching today, make sure you go get educated about Mission 44, about the Hamilton Commission, really incredible initiatives that Lewis started that are leading the way to make sure that diversity and inclusion are taken more seriously across all industries, which I think we would all agree with. And to anyone else who's watching or listening, make sure you tag Lewis and I on social media with your biggest insights. There were so many words of wisdom that Lewis shared. I wanna know which things stuck out to you, which things made a difference in your mind. And the biggest thing is I want you to pass this on to someone, right? There's someone who needs to hear Lewis's story that's gonna transform their life. And I want you to pass it on. He shared so many people that inspired him. We know he's a huge inspiration to so many. Make sure you share this with someone because you have no idea whose life you might change. Thank you so much. If you love this episode, you'll love my interview with Kobe Bryant on how to be strategic and obsessive to find your purpose.